So the topic uh, tonight is going to be about our relationship with time and our relationship with memory. They're very much linked <clears throat> one to another. And the reason we're going to be speaking about this and how this connects to this week's Parsha is uh, a little, is going to take a little time to explain, but it's, uh, it's, uh, it's very worthwhile because there's a lot to uh, learn from this, um, from this uh, particular uh, topic in, the, in this week's Parsha. So Parsha this week is Behal Bechukotai. And literally that means Behal is in the mountain, referring to Mount Sinai. And the Chukotai is in my laws. Uh, these are the first uh, words of uh, the two parshas that are joined together. We'll see as we go on that <clears throat> there's uh, some more to, to learn about these two words that's not maybe readily apparent in the beginning. One of the last topics in, in these two parshas is what we call Erchin. Spelled in Hebrew, Ayn Reis Chaf Nun. And it literally means value. Now, th there's a whole tractate in the Talmud dedicated to this mitzvah of value. And uh, it's, it's a famous tractate in Hasidic lore. It's not so much learned. Um, in the, we call it the regular Torah world. Although, of course, people who are real Tamidei Chachamim who really know Torah, so they know Erechim as well, but it's not so commonly learned. The reason it's, it's, it's famous in Hasidic lore is because one might say that the entire thesis of this tractate is psychological. And basically it's saying, it's, it's asking the question, of when somebody points to another person and says the value of this person, I will donate to the tabernacle, to the temple, what exactly do they mean? So it's almost like a question of what is the subjective self that we see in other people? Now, this is you know, the basis for discussing tremendous topics in psychology, but we're not gonna go in that direction. We're not, we're not gonna go, <clears throat> go into, that, uh, into that area. Instead, we're just going to read, um, we're just going to read how these, how these um, values play out in the Torah. It's a very interesting thing. So I'm gonna share the screen and we're gonna read the verses just so that we know what we're talking about. So it's in Leviticus 27.1. And I'm using the translation that I've used before um, from Rav Moshe Vishnevsky, the Kehos Chumash, which has um, a translation, not just of the text, which is a phenomenal translation in and of itself, but also a translation that includes Rashi and everything that the Lubavitcher Rebbe said about Rashi um, built into the translation itself. Uh, it's, a, it's a work of art. So after I plugged the Chumash, and you can get it on the code website. When a person, whether Jew or non-Jew, this is a mitzvah that is the same for Jews and non-Jews, there's no difference, articulates a vow pledging an endowment of lives. That's what it's called, an endowment of lives. Erchin is like, I'm giving the value of someone else's life. That is of a living person or a vital organ of a living person. Here we're getting into the physical side of what do I mean when I say you have such and such a value, for instance, I'm talking about some vital organ. To God, meaning to the tabernacle treasury. So the situation is like this, that I'm standing in front of my good friend, Leib, and I say, Leib's value, I will donate. 
The question then becomes, how much is lay worth? So, there are two ways to approach this. One way would be to say, let's take lay and see how much people are willing to pay to buy him, okay? So if they say he's worth $50, so that's what I have to bring to the temple. That's one way of doing it. And that is how you do it when it's a nether. A nether is another type of vow. But here, we're not saying, I'm not saying I'm going to donate his value in the sense of how much work he can do or what he's worth. Rather, I'm saying I want to donate the nominal, the absolute value of life that he contains. And when you talk about the absolute value of life, you're not talking about the body. Rather, you're talking about the soul. And the soul has different values at different times of one's life. And so we want to see this, and let's see how it works out in the verses. The fixed monetary endowment he will have thereby obligated himself to pay for having pledged the life of the male person will be dependent solely upon the age of the person whose value he pledged, as follows. If the person whose life is being pledged is from 20 to 60 years, old, the prime of life is considered between 20 and 60, the endowment will be 50 shekel, shekels of silver. The shekel being valued according to the weight of the sacred shekel, that is the shekel I've designated for you in all holy purposes, 20 gera per shekel, just telling us how much it weighs. If the person whose life is being pledged, again, between 20 and, is between 20 and 60 years, and she's a female, the endowment will be less. It's only 30 shekels. Yeah. If the person is, so what's the difference? Why, why would there be a difference between the value of a male life or male soul, soul in the body of a male versus a soul in the body of a female? According to the Torah, it has to do with how many mitzvahs, how many commandments you have. So because a woman has far less commandments, she's bound to God, not through her actions, but in a different way. So the value of the life is considered to be less. It's not the life in the sense of how much would you pay to save someone. It's saying, what is the value of a soul? To put it another way, that a soul that wants to come down into a male body has to work harder at convincing the heavens to let it come down into a male body. And it's easier to convince the heavens as it were to give me a chance to come down in a female body. Because as it were, I'm being given less. I'm, give, I'm being given less to do, less to change in the world, less to rectify the world. So the value is calculated, it's one way of saying it, by the amount of rectification that I can do in my life. Meaning that if I'm giving the task to act as a male, I'm doing more. So it's, it's like I had to invest more. Now, if the person is from five to 20 years, the endowment for a male will be 20 shekels, while that for a woman will be 10 shekels. So you see right away that younger people have, in this case, less value. Why is that? For the same reason. Because a younger person is less committed normally to the commandments. It takes time to learn how to do them. It takes time to commit to them. It also takes time if you're talking about, for instance, Torah learning. So the value of Torah learning is quite large. And so the more that a person knows, the more valuable his soul is. Now this, by the way, 
is the opposite reasoning than Western reasoning. Western reasoning seems to think that a child is more valuable than an adult. The way you see this is that if God forbid a child is, is killed or dies in some way, people feel much more sorry for the child than they would for an adult. Because there's the thinking that I came here to enjoy myself. I came into the world to enjoy myself. So the child has not had an opportunity to live. It hasn't had an opportunity to take advantage of life. So it seems like a bigger tragedy. But the truth is that since the purpose of life is to change the world, a child or a baby can change it very little. And so the value is actually less in terms of how much can the soul impact reality. If the person is from one month to five years old, this is really the baby, then the endowment for a male will be five shekels of silver, while the endowment for a female will be three shekels of silver. So here we started from 20 to 60, went down to five to 20, and finally from one month old to five years old. Why one month? Because before one month, a person is not considered to yet have a hold on life. It's called a chazaka. Chazaka is the word in Hebrew that you have a hold, you have a state of already being alive. Now we turn to what happens after age 60. If the person is 60 years old or over, then for a male, the endowment will be 15 shekels. And for a female, it will be 10 shekels. Rashi says about this, thus you see that in their advanced years, the woman's endowment value approaches that of a man. For women naturally mellow with age more than men. And Rashi in the original quotes a saying, that if you have an old man in the house, you've got trouble in the house. But if you have an old woman in the house, you have a blessing where you have a treasure in the house. That's what Rashi writes about it. And I think that we can all uh, agree that he's usually right. Okay, so let's look for a moment at something more. I'm sorry to do mathematics. I've held back for 20 weeks or however long we've been doing this. I don't think I've given one mathematical observation and my life is basically mathematics. So believe me, it took a lot of self-restraint. So today I can't hold back. We have to look at something that has to do with mathematics because there's so many numbers here. So let's see what, what happens. If we look at the ratio between the male endowment to the female endowment, we'll see that it's almost like staying how much more is the male endowment than the female? I mean, and what ratio is it more valuable? So from zero to five, it's 1.67. Five to 20, it goes up to two, meaning during those uh, years, there's more value to the male. Then it goes back to 1.67. And then like Rashi said, after age 60, 60 it, goes down to 1.5, meaning that there's less added value to being a male in old age. Okay. Okay. So now, what I wanted to do now is there's a whole book it's actually based on this, on this, uh, on these few verses that Rachel Gordon wrote, and it's called uh, "The Twinkle in Your Eye." Okay, this is a book from Rabbi Ginsburg's classes that have to do with a topic that we're now going to get into, based on these observations, based on these verses, and the. Subtitle of the book is Kabbalistic Remedies for Preserving Youth and Memory. Okay. Now, 
we have to understand that when you read the Torah, if you read it literally, then obviously you're getting the literal side. But if you want to read it psychologically, a lot of times you have to read it a little bit less literally. So the way to read this whole, these verses non-literally is to say that it's not describing the value of the soul and the difference between men and women, but rather it's giving us a ratio of how much masculine to feminine each one of us should have in us at these ages. So we're actually what Rabbi Ginsburg is saying is we're gonna meld the two together and we're going to create a composite picture of the masculine and the feminine. So what is it saying? It's saying that from age zero to five, the masculine versus the feminine is a 1.67 ratio. Should have five parts to three, even if you're a woman. Right? Even if you're a woman. We'll see in a moment what this is talking about. What does it mean to have five parts? to three, okay? Then from five to 20, it goes up to the highest, two to one, a two to one ratio between the masculine and the feminine. Meaning from five to 20, yeah, everybody has to be much more masculine than they are feminine. Okay? Then from 20 to 60 at the height of life, you go back to the 1.67 ratio. But over 60, the feminine has to subdue in everybody. What are we talking about? Uh, I'm sorry, I said that completely the opposite. From 60 and on, the masculine has to go down. So that's why the ratio is 1.5, the lowest it ever is. What ever could we describe as the masculine and feminine in this case. So I'm going to now stop the share, uh, screen share so that I can see everybody, hopefully, or more people than I usually see. Um, what could these be? Well, the first thing that comes to mind is the meaning of these words in Hebrew, masculine and feminine. What is, how do you say masculine in Hebrew? Zachar. Zachar literally means to remember. And how do you say feminine? You say nekeva. So nekeva is like the whole, it comes from the word whole, H O L E, nekev, a crevice. A hole in what? Well, from the other word used to describe the feminine, which is isha, a woman, we know that the word woman means neshia, it's the same, same root. In fact, when you say women in the plural in Hebrew, you say nashim, neshia means to forget, forgetfulness. So one way of looking at this is that the Torah is giving us a prescription for how much you need to remember versus how much you need to forget. The time that you need to remember the most, remember the um, remembering is the masculine. So the two to one ratio is from age five to 20. And we see that most people during this age pick up the most memories. What should you be devoted, devoting yourself to? So hopefully that's the age that you're in school. You should remember everything that you learned, especially if you're learning Torah. So at this, this age, it's also naturally the age at which we remember the best. 
So it's the time for remembering. But it's not just to remember what we learned, what we studied. It's also to remember something much more that we'll get to in a moment. That we feel mostly, most people feel this the most between ages five and 20. And then from age 20, it becomes harder and harder to feel this. And so you need to actually not remember, but you need to begin to forget. When you get to age 60, forgetfulness goes way up. And what you remember needs to come down. So that's a way of explaining all of this. Now, so again, we could be talking about what we learned. We could be talking about memories. Or we could be talking about the difficulties of life. When you get older, the trick is to forget the bad things. We all naturally forget as we get older. But the point is that the Torah is in a sense telling us and as you get older, you should be more feminine in the sense of more forgetful. And specifically about those things that we know that women really need to forget, right? Everybody knows that men have a harder time remembering, right? Anything that has to do with their house, with their home. So... There's all these standing jokes about not remembering an anniversary and not remembering a birthday and not remembering this and not remembering that. But men also usually don't remember the negative. They can't remember. So when was it exactly that uh, we had this argument and you, and you said this and this bad word to me? We can't remember, naturally. But women, for some reason, Remember everything. Every single thing that ever happened that was wrong, they remember. So they're really masculine there, right? And men are really feminine because they forget. So the rectification of the female, of the woman, is to learn how to forget, how to let go, not just to let go in terms of emotionally, but also to really actually forget all the negative things that happened. And so we all, as we grow older, begin to forget. But the trick is to forget the right things. And this is a whole topic that is usually, you know, not even on anybody's radar. It says like this. As we grow old, we lose a lot of the abilities that we had when we were younger. And most people see this as just plain across the board negative. But if you take a close look at each thing that we lose, be it our memory, be it our physical capabilities, being maybe our sexual energy, all these things can be positive. It all depends on how you approach it. And if you're willing to make the effort to focus and channel that loss in a certain direction. So when it comes to forgetting, the trick is to learn how to forget the negative. And to conserve memory, to remember only the positive. Specifically, the positive that happened between ages five and 20. What was that positive? Now, we won't have time to get into this. I'm just gonna 
touch upon it because it's a whole huge topic in Kabbalah and Chassidus, that the years until a person is 20 years old are considered the time of loving kindness. They're considered the time period in life for most people lasts until about age 20 when we're expected to, we're not expected, we are not expected to take care of ourselves. In most cultures, we are not expected to make a living. We are not expected to take on the burdens of life. And most people don't get even married until age 20. So there's a sense that life is good. It's very easy. It's an easygoing existence. Of course, there are always exceptions. And some people lose a parent, and some people have an illness, and many things happen. But usually, the vast norm is that the difficulties in life don't really start until adulthood, until, until we're 20 years old. So what do we take from that time period? We need to take the feeling that there is God who is loving us with kindness and taking care of us, making sure that we have everything that we need. And that needs to be the thing that we remember throughout our lives, how those years were carefree and easy. And take that memory with us and strengthen ourselves every time that it seems that life has taken a turn for the worse and it's harder and harder. Then remember that in the end, God is still holding us. We're still being taken care of. Nothing changed from when I was 20 years old, except that I'm being expected to do more on my own. But I'm still enveloped and still tampered in a certain sense by the divine light. Even in, even in the most difficult state, I'm still surrounded and kept up and enlivened by God's light, by lo God's loving kindness. So the trick here is to remember the good, specifically the good but done to us by God, and to forget the negative. And to forget the negative means to especially forget those things that happened within our families, be it between us and our spouse, be it between us and our siblings, be, be it between us and our children. It's an art form of learning how to forget. And the trick here is that we're using the natural tendency of the body of ourselves to forget more and more, to become more and more feminine as we grow old. Now, this is a general thing that as people grow old, they become more feminine, whether you're male or female, it doesn't matter. The older you are, the more feminine you become. What does this remind us of? That the history of the world, according to Judaism, according to Kabbalah especially, is that mankind started out very masculine and as time moves forward, we become more and more feminine, more and more gentle. And again, more and more able to forget the negative. That's one of the traits of the redemption. The redemption is a movement from a state of being more masculine and using power and strength, right? 300 years ago, if you weren't big and brawny, you would have less to eat. Why would you have less to eat? Because you'd be a weaker farmer and you'd have a harder time plowing and a harder time building your, your, your habitat and a harder time doing everything you need to do. 
the bigger and stronger you are, you were, the easier life was. But since the industrial revolution, all that has changed. And in fact, it's going to just continue changing even more as we build machines that do everything for us. So the world is becoming more feminine. The world is becoming less needy of physical strength, physical brawn. Rather, what you need is feminine strength. You could say the feminine strength is in the mind more than it is in the shoulders. So as we grow old, the trick is to become more and more feminine. Not just in the sense of, because the body, that's what it does anyway, but rather in the sense of learning how to forget. Learning how to forget the negative and using memory only to remember how God has carried me through life so far. And to have faith and confidence that the coming years will also be good. Be good. Okay. I want to take this one more notch up. Okay. And when I see people in therapy, one of the things that I've found, and it's not, not a big surprise, I'm just sharing this, is that we all need help in expressing what we feel. No, nothing special happens at the age of 40, except that you have more understanding, I guess. Somebody asked a question, it was on the chat. Um, which is, by the way, a good way to ask questions because then we, we don't have to stop. We can just read it off the chat. So we were saying about um, that we need help expressing our feelings. This is especially true about children. Why is it true about children? Because children have no experience. So if they feel shame or they feel ignorant or they feel whatever negative feeling that they might feel, they might not even know how to express it. They might not even know how to relate to it. And one of the most important principles in psychology is that we can't relate to something if we don't have language to describe it. We need to be able to describe what we're feeling in order to process it. And so if we have no language to describe what we're feeling in a certain sense, we can't process it. And it sits there and it runs havoc on the psyche. Now, the interesting thing is that when it comes to old age and death, we're all children. We don't really have language to describe these things. I'll put it this way, that I, I would like to quote something that I heard from my late uh, father-in-law, that he was a big French, uh, he, was, he was a French philosopher and uh, he had a PhD in French in continental philosophy, as it's called. One of the things that he used to do. Um, so he was very fond, he, he quoted this so many times that he etched it in my mind even though I didn't know him for that many years, I knew him for like 15 years. And um, he always said that Camille, Albert Camille says that death is something that happens to other people. That we, we can't really um, come to terms with our own demise. So we always see it as something that happens to other people. 
What that means is that we don't even listen, meaning that when an older person is sharing the experiences, what they're coping with, um, if they're able even to find the language, we can't hear it. I would argue that most of the time they can't even find the language. Um, so that's why they don't even really talk about it. The most that we hear people talking about is, oh, my health is this way, my health, health is that way. But there's not much discussion about what I can and can't do. What has changed in my capacity to do and how I feel about that. What does it mean? People sort of just, uh, how should I say it? They sort of just comply. They sort of just accept the loss of functionality. They don't really talk about it. And when you don't, and again, I say, this is related to the fact that we don't have a language really to discuss these things. We don't do a very good job in expressing what we feel in old age. So we mentioned that memory is one of the things that you lose. So Rabbi Ginsburg says, since you're going to lose it probably anyway, to whatever degree, a large degree, small degree, what you should pray for, what you should focus on is that whatever you lose should be the negative things. And God retained for me my memory for the good things. Okay. That's already language. That's already a way to begin to approach old age. But we can do more than that. We can build higher language when it has to do with time and memory. There's a whole question, why in the first place is there old age? Why did God create human beings in such a strange way that we take a really long time to go through the twilight of life and it's a long and arduous process? Why is that? Animals don't usually have that long a period of old age. They have old age, but it doesn't affect them the same, way, the same way that it does human beings. It's much quicker, even relative to their lifespan. I'm sorry. And it also takes, puts less of a burden on them. They continue to function pretty much the same way until the day that they pass away. It's true, they're slower, they maybe see less, and so on. And there's no telling um, why in the world uh, dogs that are, have been domesticated go through longer uh, old age. It's probably because they're being cared for. So we're, um, we're artificially lengthening their, their time in old age. So even people that have seen dogs or cats come to old age, you have to know that this is not the old age of nature. Nature is much quicker. But by man, it can, it can be quite long. It can be 10, 20, sometimes 30 and 40 years, depending on at what age you pass away. But from age 70, certainly 80, um, everybody reaches old age. Why is this process so long? Why isn't it just quicker? Let's get it over with. So the answer is, and if you want to hear more about this, then this is the topic we're covering now uh, in, on my Tuesday classes in, in uh, Torah psychology. We're talking there about identity. Um, it's on my Patreon page, whoever wants to see it. Old age is meant 
to teach us something. It's meant to make us timeless. It's meant to help us elevate above time. Remembering the good is not just a trick for feeling better. Remembering the good is not something that you do only because you're feeling down. Remembering the good is actually, if you want, I'll let myself say this, a form of time travel. What I mean by time travel is not something in science fiction. I mean that consciousness displaces itself and can return to an earlier time when we felt, like we mentioned before, between ages five and 20, surrounded by God's loving kindness. Life was easy and carefree. And someone that I know on Facebook once told, once wrote in a post, what happened to the body that I can't just eat anything and do anything anymore? Why doesn't it just bounce back? the way it used to when I was 18, right? But once you reach an older age, the body just doesn't bounce back. So when you're going back in time, it's like a form of time travel to connect with the idea that we are timeless beings. Again, Old age forces us to remember the good of the past. What do we need that for? Why not just have good right now? Because it's a process of learning how to connect with the good that's separated from us with, by time. That's what it would mean to be a timeless being. Somebody wrote here. Let me see if I can read it. Right, so because we're feminine, not rectified, um, Ilana asked here about trauma, that there seems to be more trauma than there was in the past. First of all, I'm not sure that there was more trauma, but certainly we talk more about it. So that certainly makes it more prevalent. But it would go back to the same idea that trauma is holding on to the past and holding on to the past is the unrectified feminine trait until you learn how to forget the past, forget the negative. In a certain sense, you have to learn how to forget to hurt. You have to learn how to forget to feel the pain. You have to put it out of your mind. Easier said than done, but that's the basic idea. So going back to this old age idea as being timeless, because really the soul before it came into the world was timeless. It took us time to learn how to work with time, right? When we were younger, age one, two, we didn't yet have a concept of time. And so this probably took until somewhere in our teens to really form. As we grow older, it's almost like we're shedding the garment of time. We're accepting the fact that in our essence, we're not time bound. That's the preparation for the life after this life, for the return of the soul to its root. We're learning how to be timeless. It's very interesting that most people, as they grow older, they become more open to studying Torah, for instance, studying Talmud. And they don't ask so much the questions that they asked when they were younger, which was, how is this relevant? Because there's an ability 
to transcend the need for things to be timely. And there's more and more of an ability to accept that the timeless things are perhaps the most interesting. In that sense, the older we get, the more timeless we become. And that's really what old age is. Old age is, is not being old. Again, if you use it correctly, it's not about being old and limited and handicapped. It's about being old and timeless, beyond space and time. We can't get into the space part now. I don't want to get into it now. But the loss of functionality has to do with transcending space, understanding that we are both timeless and non-local. We're non-local beings. We're getting ready to free the soul from the body and bring it back to its higher state state that was in before it came into the body. In that sense, it's very interesting that these two parshas are named Behar Bechukotai. It's explained in Chesidus that the word Bechukotai, which is literally means laws, my laws, can also mean or stems from the word meaning engraving. Behal in Hebrew literally means in the mountain, but it also means illuminate. So these two parts together, their meaning is like saying illuminated engravings. Which engravings? So the engravings are in the mind. It's like that there's a myth that, that I don't know how true it is. I'm not sure it's true. But that the more you think, the more engraved your brain becomes, the more you see these etchings on. I don't know if that's true physiologically. But I know that it's true in terms of the soul. That the more you time you spend engraving the good on your mind, on your brain, on your soul, the more you're illuminated. So an illuminated engraving is like saying that a person is connected to themselves in those timeless things that are good. And that's like the meaning behind these, the names of these two parshas, the hal v'chukotan. So again, as we grow old and forget the negative, we're actually growing more timeless. We're becoming more spiritual than we were, less time bound and physically bound. And we find it easier and easier to connect to the spiritual side of life, which is beyond space and time. So that's the meaning of this topic of erchim, of the soul value. The soul value has to, as we grow old, lean more and more to the feminine side, which, which literally means, as we said, to forget the negative and to remember the positive. Now, the truth is, we don't have to wait till old age. Don't, no need at all. In fact, the best thing to do is to start today. And how do you do it today? By remembering the past. Which past? There's a story from Rav Nachman of Breslov called the seven bettlers, the seven beggars. It's a long and convoluted story. We're going to zoom in on one part of that story called the story of the seventh battler, the seventh beggar. 
And the seventh beggar is blind. And he tells the heroes of our story, a couple, a boy and a girl, he tells them, don't think that I'm blind. The whole world thinks that I'm blind. But the truth is that it's not that I'm blind. It's that I don't see the negative. Imagine if you met somebody who had no interest whatsoever in the negative in this world. They would be seen almost certainly as a blind person who would be treated as somebody who's not in the world. There's something missing. But the real truth is that he's the one who's really in the world. And he's the one who really enjoys the world because he doesn't see the evil. He doesn't see the negative. And he says something amazing to the heroes of the story. He tells them, and though I look old, I'm really very young. How can that be? He says, because I remember the moment of conception. I remember the moment in which I became a person in this world. Meaning, he's using his memory to focus not just on how God took care of him between age zero and five or five and 20. He's using his memory to penetrate beyond his life and to go back to the point where he was entirely one with God, what he calls there the point of conception. When he was just a point in his mother's womb. But he says he remembers that. And because he remembers that his whole life is positive, it's so positive that people think that he's blind because it's as if he can't see what regular people see. Okay, so there's a lot more to develop in this uh, topic, but I would like to end on time. And if there's any questions, uh, happy to take them, and we might revisit this topic at some later date. And like I said, it's not just for old people. I mean, as old as we are today, or as young as we are, we're perfectly ready to start increasing the, fe the female side and forgetting the negative and remembering the positive. Okay, so if anybody wants to turn their microphone on, uh, I guess now's the time. Uh, before we start, I'll just read the uh, um, the uh, messages here. Toby wrote, wouldn't that make life harder in relation to a difficult present, more painful? No, because um, you're remembering the good. That's a, you're being transported, as it were, into a place where even the negative, even the difficult present is enveloped, like the feminine envelops the male. The, the good envelops the, the negative. It's like you're in a womb that's made out of God's care. That even if it's, if it's very difficult to get through this, I'm being carried through it. Again, it depends on how you see it, but then you have to see it as that I am entirely within the womb of God. Lana then wrote, do we need to resolve the events and go through Achnav, Dala, etc., or can we just forget the bulk of them? And if so, perhaps in modalities like EMDR were created by God now for this purpose, since everything is Hashigacha uh, Pratis. That's possible. Um, I would say that those things that you can't resolve, you can't forget. I, I think that that's pretty much how the rule works. Whatever you're able to resolve, you will probably be able to forget. 